And uh, very good morning to everyone. I was uh, Janne Antikainen, who was uh, moderating yesterday today, and uh, today I'll be more involved in the workshops, and tomorrow I'll work more at the uh, uh, final session again. Um, hopefully, you had very fruitful first day and uh, a very pleasant evening in the in the Riga. And now we are heading for the day two. Um, we are going to still use the Screenio uh, tool. So uh, for this uh, plenary session, there is the mdi.screen.io slash MSP forum site. Uh, and there are already some questions open for this plenary session, and uh, we'll look at that. Please note that if you're uh, using the Wi-Fi, it's different password in this house than it was in the, in the building yesterday. So look for the House of Science passwords in your badge to, to, to get to the Wi-Fi. And uh, now this uh, second day starts with the plenary session, hidden face of MSP, legal and institutional dimensions. And I have a great pleasure to hand it over this session to the panel facilitator. He is one of the eight MSP global experts. Uh, he's from the University of Seville in Spain. He, his research activity centers around the geographical consequences uh, of the United Nations UNCLOS for acronyms, which we love in this forum, uh, and also for maritime policy and ocean and coastal management. He has participated in various EASME marine spatial planning projects and is currently a member of Macaronesia MSP project team in charge of developing the atlas in support of the plan. He's also local coordinator of the Erasmus Mundus Master on Marine Spatial Planning and has authored more than 90 academic works in the international journals and other publications. So please welcome Professor Emeritus of Marine Geography in Department of Human Geography, University of Seville, Mr. Juan Luis Suarez de Vivero. Please, floor is yours. Thank you very much. Well, we are starting the, the panel with the self-introduction of each uh, speaker. Well, first, there will be a keynote uh, by uh, Professor Nikon Seininen. And the uh, panelist, speaker, now we are introduced themselves. Morning, everyone. I'm Zhao Qiwei, come from China. Now, uh, currently, I work in National Ocean Technology Center under the Ministry of Natural Resources of China. Uh, I have participated in China's marine functional zoning uh, re revision and marine management policies research. Uh, now I'm carrying out international marine special planning cooperation with South Asian and Southeast Asian countries. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Olivier Laroussini from France. I work for the Ministry for a Solidary and Inclusive Transition which is a ministry in charge of uh, the sea in France, and I am the head of the unit taking care of marine spatial planning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for the invitation, and it's great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, I'm Dmitry Fran Kamenetsky, professional secretary from uh, the Secretariat of Health and Key Commission. Uh, for those who might don't know what is the Health and Care Commission, this is an intergovernmental body established for the implementation of Health and Care Convention on Protection of the Baltic Sea Environment. And my main responsibility is actually uh, land-based pollution of the sea. And in addition to that, so I'm responsible for the work over HELCOM VASAP MSP group. Thank you. Thank you. Well, the first intervention will be a keynote by uh, professor, assistant professor uh, Nico Seininen. Uh, he is the professor of uh, sustainability uh, law at the University of Helsinki. Please go ahead. Thank you. Very, very warm thanks for, uh, first of all, inviting me. Uh, as a legal scholar, I, I feel honored. To, to participate in this event, uh, to have such a, a diverse group of planners here. So you might say that as a legal scholar, I don't know what I'm talking about in, in terms of planning, and, and you'd be right. But hopefully I can offer you some illustration, guidance, or your thera therapeutic advice, I suppose, uh, in, in, co in conducting 
planning. And hopefully, we can start a discussion today about what's, what's the purpose of MSP, what MSP is for, uh, what it is supposed to uh, accomplish, right? Um, you're now looking at my, uh, my topic, navigating social ecological complexity and uncertainty in MSP lessons from adaptive governance. That's quite a mouthful, right? So what do I mean by social ecological complexity? You've all faced this. You all faced the diverse societal and stakeholder values and interests that are included in MSP. And you've also encountered as planners the really diverse institutional framework. You know, all the diverse set of legal instruments and, and public organizations that are involved in an MSP process. That's the social complexity part. The ecological complexity part uh, is, is about you know, the, the, the nature, the physical nature and science with regard to that being highly complex. Um, in this presentation, I'll provide two alternative, even competing pictures of MSP, a utopian picture that is based on the value or the idea of uh, uh, coherence across sectors and levels of go governance and a belief that we can rationally reconcile different interests and we can have the science to, to back this up. This is contrasted with an op apologetic picture that actually we live in such a complex world that it, this is just not possible. We can try, but in the end we'll, we'll fail, right? And I'll end up somewhere in, in the middle and draw some lessons from adaptive governance theory. Uh, I must confess that as an MSP scholar, I, I started from the utopia camp. MSP, to me, when I first encountered it in 2011, seemed perfect to tackle all the marine governance problems at once, not only reconciling different interests, but also reconciling different institutional frameworks. So I wrote in 2015, what MSP is promising then is a new future-oriented planning process related to the governance of marine issues and allocates marine space both geographically and temporally for different purposes, interests which are deemed politically desirable. And this process would have almost entirely pros it would be almost entirely positive, right? I started rethinking my position uh, while the Commission was preparing the MSP directive that is now in force. As all of you know, it started as a really ambitious project, having substantive guidelines for MSPs, MSPs being coherent across Europe um, uh, and being coordinated, and uh, MSPs that would have a functional land-sea interface being coordinated to the way we actually govern our, our land areas. But as became clear in the process, uh, many of the member states had the willingness to, to make this so. But in the end, after the direc di directive proposal, uh, the Committee of the Regions gave a rather crippling opinion after which the land-sea interactions, uh, for instance, had to be dropped out, and also many of the substantive requirements for MSP were eventually dropped out. So I, I started asking myself, you know, coming from this utopian perspective that MSP is going to solve all our ma marine governance problems, is, is, this, is this so? If the directive itself is so contested already, can it, can it be so? My second question mark, for this utopian project, a uh, Plan Bothnia project, transboundary marine spatial planning project between Sweden and Finland. And, and there the planners had done a great job of, of mapping out the ecological hotspots uh, in, in both countries, uh, the protected areas, and also uh, the offshore and onshore wind power development interest areas. And they seem to lie in exactly the same areas, with both Finland and Sweden having vast coastlines. I was thinking, is this only that MSP can, can do? 
you know, it was fully rational for wind power developers because, you know, it was those sh shallow black banks close to the shore, right, that were cheapest to build for wind power. But it, it was exactly those ecological hotspots that the proposed developments would have been located. Of course, these are not finalized plans, the MSPs as such, but it got me going. It started me thinking, is rational reconciliation of different interests possible? Now, this is a nice map from, from Belgium. And you as planners, when you look at the map, what you see is that you see different competing interests. You see uh, shipping, nature conservation, uh, extraction of uh, minerals, sand, you may see even some other countries, oil and gas development, uh, wind power and aquaculture. But what I see as a lawyer is the complex institutional setting that underlies all of this. So MSP is designed to reconcile different interests, right? Like this sexual interest. But the big question is, is it designed or can it rec reconcile the institutional complexity that lies behind any MSP exercise? Well, what do I mean by institutional complexity? First of all, if you look at the legal instruments that are at play in any MSP exercise, it's really complex. Already, if you look at the EU level, you have the the spatial planning framework, the energy framework, the fisheries management framework, uh, the, the protection of species and habitats framework, uh, then you have the framework for fresh and coastal waters and for marine management. What are the legal boundaries for marine spatial planning emanating from this complex framework? I don't think anyone can answer that question clearly. Now, I can't answer that, even though I'm a lawyer specializing in many, if not all, of those fields. And when you add to the instrument complex, the international level, you have similar sec sectoral differentiation between different instruments on the international level, the national level, and finally at the local or the municipal level. So highly complex instruments. Th this doesn't come as a surprise for you, right? You, you deal with this day to day almost. But second, there's also highly complex uh, authority behind this. So if you look at the, the legally established mandates of the public authorities who are overseeing the development of the regulation that I was just referring to, it's, it begs the question, you know, can these be reconciled? When all these public authorities have a legal obligation to look out for their sectoral interests, how can this be done, especially when it's a multi-level problem once again? So you have complex authority divided between international, EU, national, and subnational level. So this is the second part of institutional complexity. Finally, you have scientific complexity. Science as an institution is sectoralized as well. Right? So, so we have uh, climate models, ecological models, fisheries models, economic models that are used in developing regulation in these different sectors. We have some efforts to integrate these scientific models. But integration of quantitative and qualitative science is not an easy thing to do. And that is something that I grapple with every day in doing sustainability science that tries to coordinate different disciplines of science. Right, so MSP, it, it's not fully utopian, it can't be because we live in a, such a complex world, but it's not entirely apologetic, we, we need it. Um, but perhaps we, we need to start thinking about MSP in a slightly different way. If we look at uh, different kinds of problems, we have simple, simple problems, complex systemic problems and wicked problems. In simple problems, we can define the, the problem, we have scientific certainty, and, and we have coherent values and, and legal frameworks. You know, laying a pipeline or a cable uh, at the bottom of the sea as a single issue might, might be such a case. But many of the questions, such as renewable energy or sustainable food production, are not as simple. 
we don't necessarily know exactly what the problem is. The science of it is complex, and we have complex legal frameworks. We might even be in the neighborhood of wicked problems. So think of MSP as cross-sectoral. We don't have one, the problem. We have multiple problems in, in MSP, multiple challenges that it tries to tackle. There's fundamental scientific uncertainty, how the climate is going to develop, how eutrophication status of the Baltic Sea is going to develop, and so on. And there are fundamentally contested values and trade-offs uh, between stakeholders and between legal frameworks. So, so, so there may not be fully rational solution, reconciliatory solutions to, to all of our problems. Okay, now I'm, I'm done with being a downer. Okay, so I started from utopia, I fell down from there. Uh, there's a lot of complexity and, and we need to deal with it somehow. But how, how do we go forward? Uh, so adaptive governance as a theory says that it's all about the range of interactions between actors, networks, organizations, institutions emerging in a pursuit of desired state of social ecological system. And adaptive governance has two components. On the left side, the green component is adaptivity, adaptive management and planning, recognition that science is never going to be ready. It's not, it's not ever going to give us conclusive answers well into the future, right? And the second is polycentricity on the social, the red side. And that means that we have multiple centers of power. We are not anymore in a world where the state or single public authorities can actually will their way through and impose what they want on the whole system. As, as we just discussed and saw, public authority is highly diverse, and in addition, we have the private stakeholders to include in the process as well, and who also have a say in what comes out of MSP. So adaptive governance tries to grapple, take seriously, all of these challenges that are thrown uh, at, at governance in general, and MSP in particular. And I argue that MSP should be viewed as adaptive governance. What does it mean? It means that there are no silver bullet solutions to these complex problems. We cannot always have rational and coherent answers to our problems. But the value, the real value of MSP is getting these sectors and levels to talk. And, and that's, that's pretty much it. I think it's the process that is important. Not so much that it will always provide a perfect rational solution at the end. I think with this background, we need to acknowledge three points. We, MSP needs to facilitate bounded contestation. And we need to bring in legal expertise and scientific expertise to kind of set the box, set the boundary for the stakeholders to maneuver within. So what I've seen in, in practice is that there, is, there are some powerful industries and also public actors, certain powerful ministries, that can take over the process, so to speak, and, and start illustrating a picture of aquaculture or fish farming, for instance, that would be utterly against EU law. And unless that kind of legal ecological understanding is included in the planning process, the legal ecological boundaries are included, it's going to be hopelessly unrealistic, right? So we need to secure the legal and, and, and scientific expertise in the process. Third, we need to accept that, that our science and our values change all the time. And we need to adapt these plans. Ten, ten years is a long time for adapting a plan. Uh, but uh, adapting it every two years is expensive, so there's, there needs to be some, some kind of uh, a, a solution there. And finally, we need to accept that measuring and getting results with MSP takes time and are not easily measured because MSP is part of this hugely complex institutional setting. It's really hard to set it apart from the, from the results of other 
governance institu uh, institutions. Thank you. Well, uh, as the title indicates, this uh, panel tries to explore some aspect of uh, maritime spatial planning that uh, may not receive adequate attention. Or, as uh, Professor Sunini stated, there is no clear uh, legal uh, support no, to uh, develop and to uh, implement in marine spatial planning. I think this will be some of the premises to uh, consider. No? The first one is that, uh, in general, maritime spatial planning, at least in more or advanced uh, cases, is already at, uh, at a stage where planning document must address more specific issues. So some of these issues, such as uh, public participation or ecosystem approach, have been widely discussed and, and debated. There is abundant literature, both uh, academic and technical. By other hand, interest in international dimension is equally widespread with important initiatives by international uh, bodies and the EU itself. No? This, is an, this, event, this is an example of this. Um, in short, a strong expectation has been placed on maritime spatial planning as a regulatory instrument with uh, broad capacities for resolution of uh, conflicts and very diverse problems no? from blue growth to conservation, protection, or conciliation of uh, interests. Although the diversity of situation is very broad at the global level, there are some aspects in the uh, MSP development process that uh, may deserve further clarification. This can be uh, the, the uh, formulation of this uh, State, no? I think it is well known how this new instrument is being provided with the legal elements to enable it to intervene in the many different aspects of the maritime sector and to define goals and objectives. The other question is how do the entry into force of new rules affect existing institutional structures? Can the same institution make the transition to the new management uh, model for maritime activities? Not in this sense, I think the intervention of uh, Professor uh, Swainini is uh, very, very timely. No? So then the question proposed for this panel uh, can be first two main questions. No? One is legal and administrative proceedings for an effective marine spatial plan, um, uh, integrated plan or structure. No? And what about national experiences? This is one of the, the points addressed by the different speakers. No? Um, two additional questions, no? in order to give more possibilities uh, to explain the two foreign national experiences. Is the same institutional structure that manage the different activities maintained, or we need new institutional structures to develop this uh, new instrument. Another point can be, is the plan accompanied by an investment program? So by the way of recapitulation, no, the core issue addressing this panel, no? Is the management plan as an administrative instrument responding to the expectation of different sectors and channeling environmental, economic, and social objectives and goals? With the experience today, what operational and institutional constraints 
and obstacles can be identified in the development of plants. So this is the, 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 the core question to, to address within this panel. Um, the different speakers now have to introduce their respective uh, ideas and approaches to these uh, questions. So, the same, the first uh, speaker will be Olivier Laudicini. Well, so uh, quite a, a lot of questions, so I, I will try through the French experience to answer more or less uh, those questions. My purpose will be to give a few words about uh, our general framework for marine spatial planning. Uh, of course, to answer the question, what do we expect? what uh, the legal framework is supposed to, to provide. Uh, but uh, I understand that the topic today is also what are the limits and uh, how can we make some progress. I think it's, uh, of course, the objective of the whole conference to, to look for progress. So if I start with our general framework, um, we have a national strategy for the sea and coast uh, at national level, and uh, this uh, is supposed to be uh, uh, translated for each sea basin. In, uh, there is four sea basins in the French, France mainland and four sea basins in overseas regions. Uh, for each of them, a strategy document <coughs> is supposed to uh, set up strategic objectives, but also do an action plan. And we do it in two phases. The first one is, uh, uh, has just been approved. Uh, the strategies have been approved in September and October this year. And the marine spatial planning is included in the strategy. Well, this national framework is uh, implementing the two directives, marine strategy and marine spatial planning. And, of course, we have an, institution, an institutional uh, consultation system with the National Council, Council for each sea basins, and consideration about uh, the debate with uh, the public. Uh, just to look at the sea basin in France and to, to tackle the question of ecosystem approach and what we are doing, uh, if you look at the Atlantic, uh, there is a limit in the middle of the Gulf of Biscay, and there is also a limit, administrative limit, uh, in the middle of uh, the Mont Saint-Michel Bay. And of course, this is not ecosystem approach, but it is um, a real constraint, administrative constraint. Uh, it's like international question of uh, working with the neighboring countries. Uh, you have some limits you have to deal with and uh, to, well, we, we cannot, of course, I think in your question, Juan, there was this question of ecosystem approach, so that's why I say we try to do it, but of course we have some constraints. Um, what the marine spatial planning is, looks like in France, I take the example of East Channel and North Sea. It's uh, delivered through a vocation map. It means that we are zoning the sea with areas for which we try to define orientations. It's the specialization of the strategic objectives um, of, the, of the sea basin strategy. Uh, of course, each zone is supposed to be consistent with ecosystem, but also with users and uh, other constraints, politically, governance, etc. Um, if I can take some examples, the first zone on the, the north, Dunkerque, the frontier with uh, Belgium. Um, um, the vocation is mainly on maritime transportation and maritime security and developing wind farms and industrial 
question of harbors, etc. If you take the zone two next to the first one, it's a marine nature park. So you understand that the general orientation is much more dedicated to nature protection and the knowledge of um, the marine ecosystem. Um, the zone five, uh, I, I hope you can have a look at uh, the numbers. Uh, it's, um, it is important, it's one of the zones, the only zone where it is said that we will develop wind farms. But also with consideration about uh, sand and gravels, again, reminding there is the issue of maritime transportation and maritime security, and not forgetting that there is some fishermen uh, and that, that it is important to try to find some cohabitation with uh, traditional activities. And last example, on the west coast of Cotentin, the Mont Saint-Michel Bay, uh, zone seven, uh, and there you have mainly fisheries, aquaculture, and tourism because of a national heritage and uh, rich ecosystems. So that's what it looks like. And for each zone, there is a descriptive sheet uh, reminding what are the main issues and giving you some keys uh, for decision. So what we expect from that? We expect, well, legally, uh, everything should be compatible with these objectives and the zoning and the strategic objectives set up for each zone. It means that when you give an authorization uh, to a project, when you do a plan, a program, uh, you should be in line with the strategic objectives at the general level of the sea basin, but also at the level of each zone and their specific strategic objectives. So it gives you, from an administrative point of view, uh, guidelines for the, uh, the teams in charge of uh, public policies, uh, but also it, it gives them some orientations for the regulations they have to take, for example, in terms of nature protection or maritra maritime traffic. Um, I, I forgot, from the legal point of view, a cross-compatibility in the law between what we are doing at sea and what we are doing for the watersheds. The strategy for watersheds, so it, it reminds me the what a framework directive, <laughs> what we are doing for it is supposed to be compatible with what we are doing for the sea. And on the contrary, we should be compatible at sea with what is said for the watershed. <coughs> I, I never said it is simple. Um, practically for developers, uh, if they look at the information, they can, well, know more or less where they will be welcome or not. Uh, but they also will find a set of information very variable for developing uh, their projects. And from all of that, we expect uh, strengthening in the decision taken uh, because, you know, whatever you decide at sea, there is some disputes. There is some people that are that disagree with what you are uh, deciding. So it's very important for the judge to, to know wh what is the context, the framework in which the decision has been taken. And of course, there is some limits to that. The first one is the scale of my previous map, uh, because probably it's not enough for making a precise decision. And for example, I, I, took, I take two examples. Uh, the energy policy, we want to develop wind farms. So I said in zone five, you can there develop wind farms. So now we are in the process of a public debate in this zone. It is a left side uh, map uh, to show the different constraints that are put on the table with the public to discuss where could we develop one, two or three new wind farms in this area. And the process will last one year, and at the end, it, there will be a conclusion and probably a tender for a one gigawatt um, wind farm. Uh, first step, probably another one in two or three years. And on the right side, the map is a vocation map management plan of the Marine Nature Park. I told you Zone 2 was a marine park. Uh, the marine park itself has a management plan, so if you want detail, you look at the management plan of the park, of course. So a problem of scale, but some solutions that are expected. Uh, there is also a limit because 
of a lack of prioritization. I remember a meeting with our colleagues from Spain. Um, they asked me, uh, but what do you really uh, want to prioritize in this area where you say sustainable development of activities? Of course, it's not really precise. Um, uh, I, I would say that, well, sometimes you don't know really what are the priority, okay? But sometimes data is missing. The knowledge of planning is missing. I'm sorry to say that. Um, and the participatory process um, trapped uh, the, the people in charge of uh, the planning uh, often because they want to please everyone. And if you want to please everyone, you have no priority at the end. So the vocation could be very general. And um, of course, uh, confronted to that, we try to look for solution. First, I want to say it was the first time we did that. So I think we will gain experience quite rapidly. Uh, and of course, we'll be, we will be more accurate the second time. Um, I should mention a cultural gap. Uh, Nico reminded the, the, the process 10 years ago in preparing the directive. At, at, at this time, France was against any marine spatial planning in uh, the seminar organized by the Commission. <laughs> so you know it's the same people today doing the marine time spatial planning. So <clears throat> we have some evolution, rapid evolution to do. And of course, there is some limit to that. Uh, but we are, we are ongoing on, on that, no problem. Uh, we are gaining a lot of new data, but also streamlining existing data to our problem. Uh, new data, for example, in uh, marine ecosystems. Of course, thanks to the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, there is new inventories, there is new monitoring system for habitats for species that we didn't have uh, only five years ago. So uh, it will be a, a factor of progress very important. And um, as I told you, we have a system in two parts, strategy and action plan. So we are now preparing the action plan, and it is supposed to be delivered in uh, 2021. So it's a possibility to do a little bit better about the planning, making some precision in such or such zone, or asking for complementary uh, planning. And finally, more and more, the local uh, authorities are involved are uh, involving their sems themselves in the management of the sea. And uh, what is uh, interesting is to know that they are doing it through Natura 2000. Because at sea, uh, a lot of coastal authorities uh, want to be the manager of the Natura 2000 site. Well, they want to be the manager of the Natura 2000 site because they want to manage the sea. And uh, in France, at the moment, the state is the uh, only authority at sea. But through this management of nature protection, uh, surprisingly, uh, the local authorities also are involved. And this is really a process rapidly uh, developing. So I, I think we will, for the coastal zone, uh, rapidly also make a lot of progress thanks to the involvement of these local authorities. So that's all for today. Thank you. Thank you, Oliver, for well, now intervention of the um, South. Good morning, everyone. Uh, now I'd like to introduce uh, China's marine special planning practice, taking around 10 minutes to uh, answer Joanne's question. Uh, in China, when we say marine special planning, the most important planning for our net, uh, for natural space is marine functional zoning. The marine functional zoning is the basis for sea use project approval uh, marine environmental monitoring and uh, marine ecosystem protection. Actually, the concept of marine functional zoning was proposed in 1979.
from then on, China has already generated three rounds of marine functional zoning. The third one is carried out now, and it covers all the areas under the jurisdiction of China. Um, as one of the first country to make marine spatial planning practice, uh, the first generation of zoning had no legal status since it was an experiment uh, that was not implemented. However, it lays the foundation for the next round of plans. In 2002, China State Council approved the National Marine Functional Zoning after the zoning system was acknowledged in the law of the People's Republic of China on the administration of the use of sea errors in the same year. Uh, actually, the pass of the sea error use law is a milestone for the marine management in China. It confirms the legal status of marine functional zoning in China. The law stipulates that China implements marine functional zones, zoning system. All sea error use must confirm to marine functional zoning. So for any organization or individuals who wants to use sea use, uh, who wants to use sea error, it must comply with marine functional zoning. In addition to the sea error use law, there are several other laws related to the marine management, and they all form the framework uh, for successful marine functional zoning implementation. Among of them, there are two important laws named uh, Marine Environmental Protection Law and the Sea Island Protection Law. So, including the marine environmental, environmental protection, marine resources, development and uh, islands protection, they all should be arranged based on marine functional zoning system. Since the implementation of these laws related to marine management and the confirmation of the legal status of marine functional zoning, the zoning system became the, basic, the legal basis for develop marine resources and protect marine ecosystem. Under the promotion of the laws, China formed a relative, relatively effective institutional system for MFD, including hierarchical classification policies and the technical system. These systems in turn guide the implementation of MFD. MFD institutional system is implemented at three levels, national, provincial, and municipal or county levels. Each level has specific tasks. This is the a sketch map made in national level marine functional zoning. Basically, China's marine functional zoning is the special planning uh, considering or uh, with the overall consideration of national sea areas. Uh, according to the natural and the geog geographic attribute, it divides the whole sea area into five major sea areas. And the dominant function for each for each area has been defined. So through the national level control to deal with transprovincial planning issues. Act as the top level planning for national marine management. Uh, the national level marine functional zoning sets six quantitative objectives. Now, China implements the classification system have eight functional zones and 22 subzones. It arranges the functions of sea area and covers all continuous sea use activities. With this, all sea area use activities are located regionally 
uh, these functional zones balance the relationship between different sea use activities and balance the relationship between marine resources utilization and uh, ecosystem protection. Now China is doing new practice for marine special planning. You know, in China, planning is not the highest level policy. It needs to adapt the national governing system and develops accompanied by the reform of governing institution. In 2012, a new ideology, ecological civilization was developed. Uh, the core requirements of this new ideology, ecological civilization, is to respect nature, confirm nature, and protect nature, so as to achieve the harmony between humankind and nature. So there is a question, how this vision could be achieved? China wants to do it through the integrated management for natural resources. In the last year, uh, the Ministry of Land and Resources, State Oceanic Administration, and the National Administration of Serving Mapping and Geographic Information were merged into a new ministry, the Ministry of Natural Resources, to responsible for the in integrated management of natural resources. Now, a new national la land special planning is formulating as a tool to uh, guide the integrated management. The planning takes ocean and land into account together. So in the new planning, the ocean part will divide the sea area based on two space and one red line. The two space is marine development space and marine ecological space. In addition, in the marine ecological space, there is a red line zone where no human activities are allowed. In this new ocean pattern, the marine ecosystem protection has been put into the most important position. And in the marine development space, uh, the industry's entry condition will be improved the sea reclamation, reclamation activities will be strictly controlled. And for the damaged sea area and the coastlines, uh, we will carry out rehabilitation and restoration to recover their, function, uh, their ecological functions. So in conclusion, uh, China's marine special planning has legal status to, gar to guarantee its implementation, and it is becoming more and more ecosystem-based. It is still a top-to-down planning with national overall consideration. Mm, the advantage is that this kind of consideration could avoid most of the trans-regional issues and guarantee the ecosystem as a whole in some degree. The new national line the special planning guides marine industries towards to high quality, low consumption, and low pollution. Uh, that takes more care of the environment. Therefore, meets the vision of the harmony uh, between humankind and nature. Under the reformed governing institution, China will form new planning law and institutional system, including law of land special planning, uh, planning formulating approval system, implementing supervision system, technical standard, standard system, and so on. That's all, thank you. Well, now we will turn to the last one. Presentation. Thank you uh, so much. I do not have presentation and I try to save time for uh, questions and debates for it. We are running out of time, I can see that. Um, actually, I'm, there are a couple of reasons why I didn't make any presentations. First of all, I'm here in quite a um, uh, difficult position for, uh, as a representative of the Secretariat of Intergovernment Organization. We are obliged to express consolidated position of the contracting parties. 
But as you probably got aware at the MSP fair, approaches to MSP quite different in different countries. So um, it's very often very hard to speak on the consolidated position. Um, the, the, the second reason why I didn't make any presentation, I don't want to uh, like bore you listing HELCOM agreements which we achieved. So you can find them at the uh, HELCOM website and it would be much more efficient than presenting them here. But anyway, uh, some points I would like to highlight here. Uh, first of all, as HELCOM, as intergovernmental organization established for implementation of the Health and Convention on Protection of the Baltic Sea Environment, this organization is entitled to set environmental goals and targets for the Baltic Sea. Uh, of course, if we look at the uh, definition of MSP, which is uh, analysis of human activity to achieve ecological, economic, and social objectives. We can't be a part of the process, but we can't be alone in this process. That is why, together with VASAP, we are, uh, we, we comprise its uh, regional MSP group, uh, which, it, which is actually meeting twice a year, and we are all contracting parties around the body here represented. Uh, we indeed achieve, achieved some agreements, such as we agreed about the basic principles of MSP, we uh, designed a roadmap, MSP roadmap, uh, we identified that uh, marine special plans are to be developed in a coherent way across the Baltic Sea and based on ecosystem approach. And I should probably point out that this uh, uh, principles, for example, they are not identical to the EU principles, for HELCOM extends beyond the EU limits, also integrating Russia, which uh, has an own vision of MSP, uh, and at the, at the own stage of that development. Uh, so uh, that was something which we agreed about, and then we step into the area of our uncertainty. Uh, the uncertainty starts from the first question, whether MSP is capable to solve the environmental uh, problem of the Baltic Sea. Uh, introducing myself, I said that uh, just my, mainly I'm responsible for the uh, land-based sources over Baltic Sea pollution. And it, from this uh, point of view, from, uh, I, I should say that no, uh, MSP can't solve all environmental problem, problems in the Baltic Sea for the last assessment of uh, Baltic Sea health, clearly ranked land-based sources of pollution in the Baltic Sea are the main uh, challenges, regional challenges like eutrophication, contamination, and others. But nonetheless, uh, yeah, just, no, I wouldn't be too fast. I will finish with that phrase, <laughs> probably. Um, then, uh, going further with the level of uncertainty, uh, when we, uh, when we are coming to the end of the roadmap, which, as I said, uh, targeted to coherent MSPs across the Baltic Sea, we ask the question, what does this coherency mean? And currently, uh, Helcom Vasab MSP group is in, I would say, intensive discussion, what does this coherency mean? And this is like a really big work, and we hope that in a year, I would be, if being invited to such a forum, would be more confident to speak on behalf of the consolidated position, <laughs> to, to express consolidated position of the contracting party. This is a really big level of uncertainty. Um, yep, we agreed as I said, about the some basic principles of ecosystem approach. So they are reflected in the guideline. But if you look at the document, the guideline is very general, and uh, it is like carved by a, a, like a stone letters at the first page of the guideline that this is voluntary. Of course, all countries consider this ecosystem-based approach the same different way. So, uh, we are now in the process of specifying that and uh, uh, discussing the 
concept of green infrastructure and other concepts, how this ecosystem based approach uh, can be specified. And with that, I'm actually coming to the uh, last phrase, uh, which kind of, which would be the, the, the only one phrase to say. Uh, currently, Helcom in the great uh, transitional period, we are uh, revising the main political agreement on implementation of the Helsinki Convention. This is Baltic Sea Action Plan. The previous Baltic Sea Action Plan, which is expiring in 2021, didn't say a single word about MSP. The last meeting of Helcom WhatsApp MSP group agreed that MSP should become a feature of the new Baltic Sea Action Plan. And actually, this is the level of our agreement for how it should be reflected in the Baltic Sea Action Plan. What are particular actions? What are, what, what can, what, which environmental problems can be solved using MSP as a tool is still open issue. So with that, thank you so much. And uh, uh, yeah, the, I, I should agree and fully support our keynote speaker who said that this is a great area of uncertainty. Thank you. Okay, many thanks. Nico, could you please join us, please? Well, now we have a series of uh, presentation with the national experiences. So uh, I would like to focus on the capacity of the plan to address with these two foreign and ambitious goals, you know, as we can see. You know? In this sense, I think that uh, because you need is uh, posing up very well uh, way uh, that the, the, the the capacity of how the plan are perceived no? as a uh, utopia, as an apology. No? So I think it's a good uh, approach. No? Well, uh, so I reiterate that uh, we try to focus on the capacity of the plan as a normative tool to integrate all this kind of different uh, goals and objectives. No? most of them very, very ambitious. No? Well, now we, we open the, the floor to direct intervention, and then we will pass to the screen. Okay. Answer to this point uh, questions. You can choose. Okay, I think I can I can try and take the second one. Uh, how can adaptive governance live together with the principle of legal certainty? Uh, that that's a good good question. Uh, that's that's the biggest question between the the adaptive governance debate and 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 and, and legal certainty. Um, there aren't any straightforward answers, but I ha I can give two perspectives. Um, the the idea of adaptive governance is to facilitate new solutions within existing legal frameworks. So so think of a uh, square box. That's, that's the law and the field of legal certainty. And then you have a blob within that box. And the blob, in this case MSP, can do anything it likes within the legal framework, within the box, right? But we first just need to establish what are the legal limitations, the, the kind of no-go areas. You cannot obstruct shipping lanes, you cannot destroy nature conservation sites, and so on and so on and so forth. Uh, so, it, in this way, adaptive governance here meaning MSP, right? You are the adaptive governance people. You are the prime example of adaptive governance. 
uh, you, you are free to roam within that box. Second would be, and, and more broader question, what legal certainty? I, I know that we lawyers, we've been, we've been fascinated with the concept of legal certainty, having clear, priorly, you know, promulgated rules for private actors to follow, you know, kind of this idea that we have this rational, coherent framework that operators can follow, but are we in that reality anymore? So, so do we have legal certainty? For, for, of course you can say that we have legal certainty in a really narrow sense, that it's likely that the shipping lanes will stay in place, but do we have legal certainty at the systemic level? Who can say to the fish farmer, to the aquaculture developer, whether they are allowed to put large-scale open pen facilities in the Baltic Sea or not? I'm not. I can't say that. There's too much uncertainty. And in most questions, it is like this. We just don't have legal certainty. I'm sorry, but that's the world we live in. We have localized certainty, not system-wide certainty. Okay, thank you. There is a, a question related to uh, data availability. So maybe you yes. want to if, answer to this. If I can try to answer this question. Uh, of course, no data, no MSP uh, could, could, could not be. It's a question of adaptive management. You don't have to wait to have all the data to decide. Um, Perhaps I was not clear enough. There is a lot of data. Uh, often data that is not known by the people in charge of doing MSP. And when I said streamlining existing data, I think it was the first important thing uh, we, we, we realized was possible. And, um, uh, but o of course, you think you, and you are right, you are not enough data on the marine ecosystems. Um, as I said, we, we did a lot of inventories new because of the marine strategy framework directive and we are still uh, Im improving and doing it at international level. Um, so if, regarding data, um, you have to be careful. The, the, the stakeholders, those who don't want things to happen, they always ask for more data and it's scientific decision. And that's a problem you have to tell them, no, we are not talking about scientific decision, we are talking about management decision, and it's not the same. And our own colleagues in charge of MSP, of course, would prefer to have strong data, strong scientific knowledge, so that they don't have to, to decide. It would be automatic, but, well, in real life, it cannot be. And if I can say a word about um, uh, the, the, the private stakeholders, is it still on the... Yes, yes uh, the, the last one. Um, they are quite well uh, connected to the process, at least those that are strongly organized at the national level, uh, stand and gravel, fisheries, uh, energy. But our problem uh, is for tourism, leisure, and th there is quite no stakeholder representative for those sectors uh, in our discussion at national level and even at the Sebastian level. Or very few. Uh, I think our ministry in charge of um, sports is the only one <laughs> talking about leisure activity, nautical um, activities. And, uh, and, and there, too, the lack of data is huge. Because we want official data, we take the AIS data of leisure uh, vessels and put them on the map and say, well, here are the, the zoning of the important uh, areas for uh, leisure boats. Um, but no, uh, wh what about windsurf? Wh what about uh, uh, the beach? N nothing. So you see, I, I, I think stakeholders are not all well organized. Even NGOs are not uh, very well organized. I mean, the big NGOs, no problem. WWF, they are here, no problem. But the, the local ones, uh, we have made a lot of progress since 10 years in having the local NGOs uh, looking at the sea, not only at the birds, but also at the sea, and, and 
beginning talking about the sea and the issues for them and participating to the debate. But at the moment, they are not so well organized at the regional level and at the national level. So they are lacking in, uh, in the process of uh, discussing MSP. So you introduce me. Uh, I feel most confident speaking about data, probably. And uh, in this respect, first of all, I would say that uh, HELCOM always stays on the principle that all HELCOM agreements are based on the best available scientific knowledge, which says if we speak about the earth science, it is never perfect. It always developing. So this is not the problem for MSP only, but it for all sectors when we touch upon the environment. So we never get absolutely perfect data. And we regularly up update our data, our information, and we update our political agreements in this respect. This is the first point. Uh, the other point, I think a lot is going on in the region, and this goes on in the right direction. There are many international funds. To countries do not endeavor alone and separately to compile those data. And uh, uh, as you can see, for example, at the HELCOM site, uh, at the HELCOM stage of this uh, MSP fair, uh, we are trying to serve for the contracting party, for the countries acting in large extent as a hub for this collectively uh, compiled data and databases. So then, of course, uh, if we speak, we, we can't say no data, no MSP. Uh, I would rephrase it such a way that the MSP as efficient as good uh, information background. So it's more about efficiency, but not presence. Thank you. So for the, uh, uh, I'd like to talk something about the third question, like better connect the prevent stakeholder in MSP process. Uh, for China, actually, uh, we uh, the pub, uh, during the MSP formulating process, it is uh, not enough for our public en engagement. But I think um, if we, uh, but I think, uh, cause our, we do our MSP process uh, based on uh, overall consideration. So actually, we consider the private stakeholders uh, interest, their benefits. We actually, we consider their benefits uh, during our MSP process, such as we will, um, such as we have a minimum, a minimum uh, aquaculture area, so that we, uh, so in, in that case, we can ensure, we can guarantee the uh, prevent like prevent fishermen the fishermen's interests how how can they get a better life so we ensure their life uh, life quality uh, I think this is a way we connect uh, we consider private stakeholders interests in our MSP process but in the future we will um, enhance our public engagement in the formulating process thank you before to uh, address the other or the new uh, question, I would like to strengthen the point of uh, this panel. No? It's about uh, legal and institutional issues. So I would like to ask to the national representatives if they uh, think that uh, it is necessary to a new design of the institutions involved in maritime spatial planning? Or should be the existing institution that uh, should be uh, maintained uh, in developing the, the, the plans? No? And a second one is, uh, do you think that the existing uh, law is enough to address the different goals and objectives? It is enough complex to address these uh, quite different objectives. Um, okay. Um, do we need to design new institutions? Uh, somehow we did it. Um, I mean, um, 
that the, the, the unit where I am is a delegation for sea and coast. Well, it has only four years. It is only four years old, and uh, it has been created as a coordination unit in our ministry, but also with other ministries. And logically, we are in charge of the national strategy of the Secretariat of the National Council for Sea and Coast, which is new too. And uh, we have the equivalent for each sea basin. There is a coordination unit now uh, for all public policies and uh, a council at the sea basin level. Um, this is new, so uh, it is not very strong. Um, but I don't think it's a legal problem. Legally, I think the texts are quite okay. It's uh, really a question of, uh, um, well, practicing, uh, being known, acting, uh, gaining in uh, know-how. And, and I, I think it's much more that than uh, uh, making a new legal text uh, saying, well, you are you have the obligation to do that or, or that. And uh, in the end of my presentation, I talked about this local governance. We have a debate at the moment about uh, the competency of uh, the state and the local authorities. Should we change things? And the conclusion is, well, no, there is plenty of possibility. It's just a question of um, being interested and involved in what is going on just in front of uh, your uh, municipality or department or region. Uh, the texts are quite okay to do that. Uh, again, it's perhaps a question of culture rather than a question of a, a, question of a legal text. Thank you. So I remind that in some EU documents, one criteria is uh, do not create uh, more uh, costs additional costs uh, or creating new administrative bodies that increase the, the, the uh, expenditure of the different administration. So my question is, is this a new, uh, a good criteria? Can be maintained at this uh, principle that not create new institutions, not uh, create new, uh, new needs for uh, to uh, increment budget and so on. It is possible this? That's not an easy question either, but <laughs> right. So it depends on what kind of picture you have of MSP. So if you have that kind of utopian picture, I suppose we should completely overhaul our sectoral you know, national planning and management systems. We should also think about overhauling the sectoralization of the EU system and the international system, uh, as well as the municipal system. And you, you quickly see that, okay, this, this may not be realistic, right? So a complete overhaul of the institutional framework from sectoral planning and management to integrate it is, is not easy. The strong-rooted cultural uh, path dependence is there. But at the same time, I do agree that it doesn't make sense to add an entirely new institutional structure on top of the existing ones. And, you know, in the end, at the end of the day, it is MSP and these integrated, integrated approaches are integrated into the existing systems of each country. And this is the reason why they take different forms. So, so there's no silver bullet here, here either. It, it depends on the context and it depends on, on the system. And then whether law is enough, whether to have, if you have the MSP legislation in place, whether that's enough for, for implementing MSP, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. Because there also needs to be a, a cultural shift from sectoralization uh, to, to integrated planning, planning and management. And, and that takes time. It, it takes much longer time than a few years until 2021 or a few years after uh, passing national MSP legislation. Thank you. At least what we can see in our contracting party, so each contracting party, uh, so there are no specific institutions created in, in a single country to run the MSP, uh, run the planning. 
So it is kind of based on the existing system. But what should we specifically point out that this is so much cross-cutting issue. So it uh, requires a platform for proper dialogue between different authorities as well as between different countries. For, and we th for example, in the HELCOM frame, we established this specific group which is maintaining this dialogue. I don't know, this is more for the contracting parties to judge whether it works well or not, but this is how it, how it works now. So you want to add something to this? Yeah, for your, uh, the second question, the law, is it a law enough to, to address different goals or objectives? Uh, I, I think uh, only have the law is not enough, but uh, I think it's the, may, maybe, in my opinion, it's the most important thing to have the law to, to confirm its, like, confirm its status, to confirm the MSP is important or we need this MSP. Then, in this MSP planning or document, we can step by step to uh, control that uh, goals or objectives like in uh, s different fields, uh, social or environmental, it's very complex, but we need to consider it uh, under the laws, like under the law's force. Then like each uh, kind of different departments, marine related department can follow this law or follow this planning to do to, to control these, uh, to get these goals or objectives together uh, under the, uh, under the, the, the uh, coordination, under the coordination between different departments, but under the law. Yeah, thank you. We have five minutes, maybe a last round. The question could be, have you some model for a design of the new institution? I mean, if you're talking about the policy. Well. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, I came without my one. Uh, so th that's a good question about the policies and the integration different policies. Actually, it seems like the MSP, uh, this planning, is o already a tool to integrate these policies. But we face this uh, gap between uh, goals and targets of various policies, not only in, in MSP. For example, we, we have just recently discussed the gap between Water Framework Directive and, and MSFD, and they are thinking and speaking about different targets at all. They are uncoordinated. And uh, just, I, I gave the EU example, but I could say the same about Russia. They have also like the same kind of laws with the, with the same monstrous break. I think we should think more about the coordinated, agreed, well transparent and well substantiated targets. This is as a practical tool. And the same for MSP. So as it is like by, by nature, uh, something serving f to reach, to achieve uh, environmental, social and economic targets, we are to clearly formulate what we are after, what are our targets. Well, be, being at the head of a coordination unit, I'm dreaming, of course, um, of a new institution merging all those directorates and uh, institutions that uh, don't want to work together and being the head of it. But, <laughs> of course, uh, it's not very serious. Uh, if you do that, probably you will do a marine institute alone and uh, we will fail, for example, in dealing with the land-sea interaction, which is quite important. And it's not only marine spatial planning. If you talk about maritime policy, it's a question of harbors, a question of inland uh, connection to the big cities, etc., etc. So, um, well, um, I'm not always pleased about being a coordinator with no power, but I think it, it works not so, not so bad. Uh, just, just a word about the expenses. Uh, there is new expenses, not to do the planning, but because talking about the planning and the strategy 
you, you have things you have to do you, you didn't do before, like the inventories about marine species and habitats. So obviously there has been a lot of new expenses in France for the, the sea uh, strategies. But because probably we forgot to do them before. Thank you. So the last intervention. More? No. Okay. Well, guys, many thanks to the speaker. I appreciate it very, very much uh, your contribution to this panel. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay.